Good morning, welcome to IndyCar on the 10th of March. Um, now, I've got to refrain from making any comments about which of the three candidates in the SNP leadership uh, election is my favourite, because let's face it, I'm not a member of the SNP and I don't have a vote. Although many, many people have actually suggested that I should join and exercise my right as a member to vote for who I want. Unfortunately, um, that would mean it would be very difficult for me to comment about the SNP with any kind of impartiality and it would lead to uh, accusations that I was biased one way or the other. So I'm not going to do that. But what I will say about the hustings so far is that the pressure on the candidates now uh, to speak about the urgent need for independence and the pressure coming from all corners of the independence movement now for some urgent action is leading to a change in the narrative um, being expressed by the various candidates. Now notice that um, Kate Forbes has apparently now uh, become sort of neck and neck with Hamza Yusuf in the polls, but like many of you, I suspect polls are, well let's say not that accurate, because when you, when you think about it, the SNP has about 100,000 members, maybe more than that, and a polling company will simply poll 1,000 of those, which means that's 1% of the entire voting population of the SNP. It's not really going to be that accurate a figure. However, whatever the figure is, the members of the SNP have got a very difficult choice to make. Which of the candidates do they think is going to progress us closer to independence than the others? Ash Regan has, I think from the very beginning, uh, been the underdog in this because her uh, her chosen methodology, which is to use any general election as a means to gauge support for independence and the, the methodology that she's outlined uh, for starting or attempting to start negotiations with the UK is one which I think um, would be inevitable anyway. However, Kate Forbes, I noticed, has started to make much more of um, an issue, shall we say, of the urgent need for independence. She has also distanced herself dramatically, I think, from the policies of the previous um, administration and has been roundly criticised this morning from all kinds of different quarters for basically saying that the previous administration was at best mediocre. However, this is the kind of thing that leader, leadership candidates do. They want to put some clear blue water, some big uh, difference between themselves and previous incumbents in order to, uh, to gain support. Fair enough. Now, whatever the election result is, and whomever it is which, uh, who, who becomes the new uh, leader of the SNP, will probably become the first minister and will be tasked with trying to find a way to get us to independence um, without having the, uh, the, the normal access to democracy that we would expect for a decision of this size, which would normally be a referendum of some kind. It's been, um, it's been said, in fact, by no less than one of the most senior legal advisors to uh, the United Nations that Scotland could have uh, a referendum under the terms of the uh, the, the actual treaty, no, sorry, uh, under, the, under the terms of the United Nations Charter uh, in Article 1.2, which guarantees the right to self-determination. However, um, many people think that this is not going to fly because the United Kingdom has shut down all access to any kind of referendum uh, coming out of Holyrood. Now, Holyrood is, as we know, uh, limited deliberately limited in its scope by the Scotland Act, which prevents it from making any kind of legislation which has any effect whatsoever on the Constitution of the United Kingdom. But after there is a vote, and let's assume that we win this vote and we get a majority of voters voting for, let us say, the SNP in the next general election, and we win a huge majority of seats, but we also, more importantly, win a majority of the votes. How then do we proceed to independence? Because the new leader of the SNP, and I'm assuming that would be also the First Minister, would then need to approach the United Kingdom and say, look, we have demonstrated through a democratic event the will of the people of Scotland that they want independence. We now demand some negotiations with you to end the union.
And we know that the United Kingdom is not really aware of that. They're going to say, well, this is a general election. It can't be used for this purpose, and we don't recognise your vote as being anything of the sort. Where then do we go? Well, we have to seek overseas uh, support. We need to get the, um, the support and the recognition of that majority from other countries. Now, the uh, United Kingdom's uh, House of Lords has already noticed this, and I read this morning that the uh, one particular lord, whose name escapes me, has suggested that the British government should use the Scotland Act 1998 to prevent any Scottish government minister who travels abroad for trade purposes or for any kind of outreach with other nations, which is allowed under the Scotland Act, uh, to be prevented from talking about or even mentioning the future of the British Constitution or any potential means uh, of separating Scotland from that union. So the British government recognises the danger of recognition and there are already some noises are being made in Westminster to try to prevent this. The question really is how are they going to know what any SNP foreign minister says in a closed room with let's say the foreign minister of a European nation. Are they going to spy on them? Are they going to bug the rooms? And if they did, how would they prove it and what would they do to that particular minister? This is a difficult question to answer, but it means that we still need the support of these other countries. And if it's not coming from ministers, then it needs to come from other envoys making contact with the foreign ministries of particular European countries who are nearest to us to gain their support and their recognition for any majority which we manage to achieve in a general election in the UK. That then follows a strategy because once you have the recognition of, let us say, you manage to get I don't know, 10, maybe maybe more of the European nations to say that they would recognise such a majority, then the European Union needs to then get involved and there has to be a vote about it because it's not just the individual foreign ministers of these nations that would be required uh, to give that support. It would have to be given by the European Union itself and that would probably require some high-level meetings of foreign ministers and potentially uh, the Council of Europe to come to ruling on it. So all of those things need to be done and the strategy needs to be devised for doing it, which circumvents the very obvious traps which the House of Lords are planning to set using the Scotland Act of 1998 to prevent it. Uh, and so we are faced with literally a little bit of um, subterfuge. We need envoys to go to these European uh, foreign ministries uh, and to lobby for this to happen. Who those people might be, I don't know, but this kind of lobbying was successful prior to the setting up of the current Scottish devolved parliament, because prior to that, envoys from Scotland, not politicians, by the way, but high-level envoys, educated people, knew what they were talking about, did approach the Council of Europe and said, look, Scotland, if it's part of, uh, going to be part of the European Union and part of the United Kingdom Union, there must be self-government in Scotland in order for the European Union to accept the United Kingdom as a full member, uh, not only of the the um, of what used to be called the common market, but also the social chapters of the actual political union itself. So if it succeeded back then and put pressure on the UK government to basically give Scotland a referendum on a devolved administration, then a similar type of activity needs to be carried out once we achieve, or even preferably before we even vote, to achieve a majority for independence in a general election. And that's something that we need to think about doing at the moment. It may not be something which Scottish politicians, either in the SNP or in the Green Party or ALBA or anywhere else, uh, are currently thinking of doing. But it needs to happen because we need to make those contacts, even if they're made unofficially at low level, um, under a cloak of secrecy, it doesn't really matter. We need to get that support because we know the United Kingdom is never going to accept a majority for independence within a general election. They have already said that they wouldn't recognise this and I think there is always a, a trap there being laid by the British state as soon as we try to do this. However, with this being the only democratic event which is left available to us, 
then it has to be recognized by other countries, not just in Europe, incidentally, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, all the former colonies of the United Kingdom which have broken free, I am fairly certain, would be in support of an action like this. So we need those envoys and they need to get out there before the vote is taken. The support must be elicited and agreed well before we start voting about it. Because as well as having things like our own currency and our own supply bank and our own pension scheme and our own defence, all the rest of that is necessary, we need to get that vital recognition of a majority vote for independence in a general election. And that is something we all need to talk about and we all need to put pressure on our politicians and other uh, pro-independence groups, both uh, big ones and small ones, as well as civil society or civic society, the churches, uh, the various religions of Scotland, all of them, to agree that we need to seek that kind of recognition because without it, it's very difficult for us to push forwards and get the United Kingdom to finally agree that separation needs to happen and it is being voted for by the people of Scotland in a majority in a democratic event that is respected all over the democratic world. So that's where we're at at the moment. But I think, as I've said before at the beginning of the programme, that the narrative in terms of going for independence has now become much more front and centre in the hustings that I've seen so far. And Kate Forbes has, well, let's face it, she's been pretty brutal in the way she's campaigning. She definitely wants that top job, and there are many people who want her to have it. But there's probably an equal number who support Hamza Yusuf as well. Ash Regan is the wild card here. Nobody really knows exactly how much support Ash has. And so it's still anybody's race. And as I've said before, the polls on this are a tiny sample. They're, they're 1% of the voting population of the SNP. So we can take no real um, information from those which is of any particular relevance at the moment with still just over a week to go before the vote itself. Anyway, that's it for me today. Just thought I'd try and outline a few of the potential pitfalls of going for independence via general general election, but also point out that things are changing within the hustings and talk of independence is now becoming much louder uh, within the hustings themselves and I hope that remains the case because independence is not just something we aspire to as something which would be nice. This is essential if we are to fix the problems which everyone in the candidacy has been talking about. The poverty, the fuel poverty. Um, the problems with the NHS, the problems with the ambulance service, all of these problems stem from massive underfunding and basically the Barnett formula in England basically starving the Scottish NHS of the same resources that have been flowing into the NHS in England, which we know are getting cut more and more and more. So to end all of that problem, we need our independence and that's why it's more important than ever that all of the um, candidates talk about this and make this one of the prime, if not the prime goal of their candidacy. Anyway, I shall see you soon. In the meantime, thank you for watching. I hope the programme has been less interrupted than interfered with today. Uh, I'm now using a virtual private network to uh, produce my programme, so I'm hoping you're getting a much better and clearer sound quality today. Let me know in the comments after the programme. In the meantime, keep the faith and hopefully I will see you again perhaps on Sunday. But uh, let's see what happens in the hustings over the next few days. Bye-bye for now.